Professor Almaderis now, um, very nice to see you and thank you for taking time after a, a busy day. We, we've only just finished our breakfast, so it's easy for us. Um, uh, you're going to talk to us a little bit about how you join metal bits onto people bits, but I don't think that's the technical description. Perhaps I could hand over to you to explain to us. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And do I press that one? Sorry, I'm very computer illiterate. Um, so, um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Munjid Amderis. I am an orthopedic surgeon from Sydney, Australia. And um, today I'll give my talk about segregation. And, oh, sorry, that was, um, I was going to talk about segregation as well, um, because um, I spent um, a significant time in, uh, in prison and um, in solitary confinement in detention center. So I share um, the experience that uh, uh, Dr. Brown had uh, from her uh, PhD study. And uh, I must admit, uh, I gave a TED talk about uh, the Wheel of Fortune uh, some time ago at Sydney Opera. And um, I talk about uh, the position on the wheel and one day you're on top, one day you're at bottom. And, and I must admit, uh, my time during the solitary confinement was the lowest time in my life. And um, it did um, leave a huge impact in my uh, personal life and, um, and the way I view things. Anyway, um, moving to uh, my talk about OC integration. Uh, OC integration surgery is um, a kind of um, a cool, uh, fascinating technology that um, um, uh, I was inspired of um, uh, doing when I was um, a teenager at the age of 12, where I watched the Terminator in 1984. And um, um, I was fascinated about how human can um, mend with a machine and I uh, wanted to do that. So um, there you go. Um, we are reaching our 1000 cases and uh, I'll talk to you about it. I do have um, uh, financial disclosures to make um, as um, I am the designer for the implant and I own the rights to it. Uh, so, um, and I, sh I do some um, work for other companies, manufacturing hips and knees and other boring stuff with orthopedic surgery. The objective of this presentation is to outline the use of OS-integrated titanium implant uh, to treat amputees and present novel and complex cases in this field. So I do apologize up front if uh, some of my images um, are a bit um, gory and, um, and if it uh, can be um, uh, displeasing to some people. This is one of my uh, patients uh, walking, as you can see, with the OSI integrated implant. And uh, you have to believe me when I say he is an MPT. Um, so um, the term OSI integration uh, started uh, in the 60s, um, which means it's a structural and functional connection between macroporous surface of an implant and uh, living bone tissue. Um, when it becomes spontaneously attached uh, and connected to a prosthetic limb, it applies to amputees, basically. Um, I take a step back and talk about amputation. Amputation of an extremity results in a major change in a person functional, uh, um, functionality, body image, and quality of life. It is estimated that um, uh, more than 50% of amputees return to work within a period of not less than a year. And um, over 90% of bilateral above knee amputees um, um, spend the rest of their time in wheelchairs. So um, um, the problem with um, uh, managing amputees um, is that um, what we had uh, before OSI integration is still a technology that's been there for hundreds of years. And despite extensive research regarding socket design, which is the bucket that wraps around the, uh, the residuum of the limb, um, we still have problems with skin friction, heat, rash, ulcers, blisters, perspiration, chafing, infection, and general discomfort. Also, a human body change in size as the day go by and in certain uh, monthly cycles in females, they, um, they do change um, in, the, in the size as well. And when you get a bit more um, overweight, um, that, that, that changes as well. So um, 
when you wake up in the morning, your body is much smaller than at the end of the day as well. So during the day, you get swollen with um, with fluid accumulation. And uh, by the end of the day, people who um, have a socket that fit them very well in the morning, it doesn't at the end of the day. And a simple example um, on um, people wearing a socket or wearing tight shoes when you um, uh, get on a plane. Well, not that we do that um, anymore, thanks to COVID. Um, by the time we get off the plane after a long flight, um, um, the shoe become very tight, or if you take it off, uh, it's very difficult to put it back on. Um, the other aspect that we discovered is that um, amputees, when um, um, they wear a socket, they lose their uh, proprioception and the sense and proprioception mean the sense of the ground. Um, so um, they can't walk into dark rooms and they can't uh, close their eyes and stand on their feet, they would fall. So this is a very important aspect and that uh, results in these people unable to uh, return to handiwork or manual laboring and such as going on scaffoldings and things like that. So these were the general problems for um, uh, general amputations, but the problem get worse if the patient have shorter residuum. And you can see this patient has very short stump of the femur. Patient have uh, skin grafts that makes um, uh, it very difficult for the socket to fit. Um, flaps and um, uh, soft tissue redundancy. And believe me, this was not done by a bad surgeon. The surgeon that um, uh, does the amputation, traumatic amputees mainly, is the um, uh, bumper of the car or, uh, or the, um, 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 the side of the, wall, uh, the, the, the road that uh, the patient crash on. And um, that, that surgeon usually doesn't have any medical knowledge or, um, uh, or degree. And by the time uh, the patient gets to the operating table, uh, the last thing the real surgeon um, care about is to make the stump look good because he would have, he or she would have an anesthetist breathing on their neck, telling them to close the wound before the patient died within, within minutes. So, um, that results in these kind of um, um, problems. Uh, skin scars also cause uh, um, significant challenge with the socket fit. And um, when you amputate a bone, the bone grows and uh, cause bone spurs. And this is an example of a large spur, which is called heterotopic bone ossification. Um, and that results in uh, difficulty in fitting with the socket. As we get older, our skin become more fragile and uh, would become more delicate. In, um, and, um, and as a result of that, um, the skin um, tear apart if it touches um, uh, hard objects. And um, as you can see, this is an example. Um, also, when you amputate a nerve, the nerve um, endings uh, start to grow and they spread out and they become like a cauliflower. And this becomes something called neuroma. And neuroma can cause significant pain and irritation. And um, when it fits in the socket, uh, that can be stimulated and, and lead to significant problems with patient walking. So, the scientist, uh, um, uh, or uh, he was a naval surgeon, basically, and Ambreas Barre in, um, in 1529 invented the socket prosthesis, which is uh, the first method to rehabilitate amputee, amputees properly. And you can see um, over 500 years, um, the socket uh, shape hasn't changed. And um, this is um, on the right hand side of the, uh, the image is, um, is uh, one of my patients uh, with his uh, socket prosthesis basically uh, uh, before um, um, uh, having uh, osseointegration integration surgery. And the design is still the same. So with limbs and, uh, and artificial um, uh, parts uh, that connect to our body, we have great deal of advancement and um, um, a lot of bionic uh, development that um, um, make fascinating techno uh, technologies work, um, uh, where uh, you know uh, movement are mimicking what uh, what a human body can do. However, to connect them to the human body, we still have a, a serious problem. So, what I'm going to talk about is a revolutionary solution that eliminates all socket problems, um, lower the energy consumption, increase proximal joint range of movement, allow more stability, and restore proprioception, which is the sense of the ground, and improve overall pain, mainly back pain. And this is called osseointegration surgery for amputees. So. 
I'm not the inventor of the technique. Um, um, I am simply the person that um, uh, brought it to um, uh, become more popular in the world. And you can say that um, um, I'm not Mercedes Benz, um, uh, um, but I'm the um, Henry Ford that made it affordable and available to people uh, around the world. And you can see these are the, sims the systems that um, um, are were available, some of them uh, are no longer available, like the Opera system, which is the Swedish system. And um, uh, that was the the first um, um, CE marked or um, uh, readily available, commercially available system in the world, and that's made in Sweden. Before that, there were trials in America and um, in the United Kingdom, actually, um, and that that failed and then you have the um, uh, german system which uh, have done around 150 um then we have a system in stanmore in the united kingdom um have done around 16 cases i think and um, um and um, that has stopped uh, unfortunately um the americans um, uh, started uh, recently and uh, again and um and uh, our system in Australia have um, exceeded the 1,000 cases and it's rapidly developing and there are a few uh, uh, implants here and there. Majority of the implants that, um, with the exception of the Swedish system, use Presfit technology, which is the technology that um, 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 allow um, the, um, the implant to be um, in, inserted by hammering it inside the, um, uh, the bone and allow the bone to grow into it. The opera system is, uh, is a different where it, it's screwed in uh, to the, um, uh, to the um, uh, bone. Um, some uh, systems have uh, used two-stage surgeries, as in you do the first stage where you insert the implant in and then you wait a while for the, for the wound to heal and then uh, you connect it, you come back and connect it to the external environment. Um, our system among the systems that uh, can be applicable for single stage surgery. These are shapes of what implants are available. Um, the, um, uh, the theory is the same uh, by inserting um, um, a titanium um, metal um, um, object into the medullary canal or the, or the, or the uh, hollow uh, part of the, uh, of the femur or the tibia and connect it through a small opening in the skin uh, to the outside environment just makes uh, sense actually and it's um, it's very simple but people hasn't come up with this uh, idea uh, long ago so in australia we started the orgap um, uh, team and um, we utilize a press fit implant design. We employed a guillotine amputation uh, technique for the, uh, for the limb and we established a university-based multidisciplinary team, which is very important to um, get the basics um, uh, right. And um, we redesigned the implant and, um, <coughs> and altered the surgical techniques a bit and implemented the clinical data registry and introduced um, um, the infection um, uh, uh, classification monitoring system because the biggest problem with this technology is the fear of infection because it's a piece of metal stuck inside uh, your body and it's exposed to the external environment. And um, you can see all, all around the world, we have many countries that um, uh, have um, 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 been performed and um, basically we moving very fast we are with uh, with our technique and design and um, um, and we move to 3d printing uh, for the implants to mimic the shape of the of the bone and then we took a step back and now we're machining everything uh, due to uh, the structural integrity of the implant um, basically the system is very simple I don't want to bore you with these uh, shapes it does have uh, rotational stability it does have uh, macroporous structure that allows bone to heal into it and um, uh, basically, it's uh, fitted with a connection system between the, the body and the implant. That's the black object that looks like a grenade. And basically, that has the fail-safe system. Uh, so if the patient fall, it can disengage and prevent the patient from breaking their, their leg. Um, with the, the movement of this technology throughout the years, uh, initially, we thought that um, uh, by having a soft tissue buffering, um, as you can see in the purple area, uh, you would insulate the bone from um, uh, being uh, contaminated with bacteria. And that was the wrong thing to do. And uh, we realized that, so we changed that. And now 
what we do basically, we change the design and the surgical technique. Um, and what, what I do now, I make um, the uh, soft tissue uh, buffering as minimal as possible. And sometimes I do suture the skin uh, to the periosteum or the bone covering. And this um, is a, in a, um, uh, an aim to uh, uh, recreate an antelope or, or a staghorn, basically. And uh, we have achieved that in many patients, basically. Like any technologies, there are indications and contraindications for this technology. So um, basically, our indication is people who are struggling with the with the traditional socket prosthesis, um, they need to be non-smokers um, and uh, for at least three months, and they need to be compliant. Um, funny enough, when I went to do some of my charity work in Southeast Asia and in, uh, in the Middle East, and um, for example, I went. Um, uh, to Baghdad, and um, um, I was confronted in the first day with 95 patients, and um, I tried to follow the indication and contraindication protocol, basically, and, and I started um, seeing patient one after the other, and by um, uh, the time I reached number 50 that I disqualified, um, I had a nod on my shoulder, and um, um, one of the doctors there said, uh, well, you might as well just pack your bags and go because um, uh, you won't see any non-smokers here. Um, and we ultimately uh, ended up doing 188 cases um, um, in uh, eight visits. And uh, two of them were non-smokers and I don't know why they didn't smoke. Um, they lived in Iraq. Um, a couple of the contraindications such as uh, peripheral vascular disease and diabetes, and um, they can be an indication in certain circumstances. And now, um, knowing that the vast majority of amputees are due to peripheral vascular disease and diabetes, uh, we have expanded the, the use for this technology uh, because uh, initially we um, uh, used this technology mainly for traumatic amputees, uh, tumors, and congenital malformation, uh, while now, um, I, the way I foresee the future is that um, uh, vascular amputees will be the biggest uh, users of this technology, especially that it does uh, work. Um, again, smoking and skeletally immature patients were contraindicated, and um, um, you know that um, uh, rule um, uh, went through the window in Iraq and um, and Cambodia and. Uh, few other countries uh, such as Lebanon, um, uh, Israel, and, um, and Jordan. Um, skeletally immature patients, we didn't know what to do because um, that um, group of patients um, uh, carry significant um, uh, problems with it. Uh, one of which is that the, the consent, because are we gonna consent the patient parents and what if they grow up and they don't like it? Um, uh, and the other thing is that uh, with the growing bones, we didn't know whether uh, how it's going to react to the to the implant. And uh, interesting enough, um, I've done few um, uh, children now, and uh, what we notice is that it does stimulate the bone growth. So um, uh, the bone does grow more normally uh, in an amputated limb that is attached to a robotic arm or leg um, than um, if it's um, um, not connected to anything and it's just uh, encased by a socket. Um, the credit goes to the team that I work with and they uh, basically um, great um, um, uh, collaborators and, um, and um, I'm very grateful uh, that I have a great uh, group of people. And uh, basically uh, we have a system that uh, was established from peer to peer um, uh, interaction of patients uh, where we bring other patients to, together and this uh, we, basically copied the what what has been done with cancer surgery uh, basically and does uh, show that it has proven uh, that it works very well um, multidisciplinary team one-on-one uh, -on -one consultation with well the whole um, uh, group of clinicians including uh, the surgeons the um, uh, rehabilitation physicians this uh, the um, uh, physiotherapists the nurses and uh, the clinical um, 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 uh, uh, liaison officers, as well as the um, engineers sit in one room talking to the patient, and then the patient get taken away uh, to have um, their psychological assessment and, um, and pain assessment uh, separately. 
We do uh, collect a lot of data from um, um, our patients and um, and uh, when we started, we decided to um, uh, run this very scientifically because it, we were uh, basically um, um, doing an out there technology way outside the box and uh, can be criticized very easily. Um, um, similar to the way that uh, uh, Sir uh, Charlie, when he um, invented his um, uh, way of doing hip replacement and uh, the amount of criticism that he got and now look at it, um, um, the whole world um, is grateful for uh, for his work that we, we all have um, a hip replacement available to us to um, as a routine operation. And that's what I hope that this will become in the future. So we do uh, collect energy consumption uh, uh, through sensors and, uh, and, and we do use uh, special objective measures of like time upon go, uh, six minute walk test. And uh, we do collect subjective data such as the SF36, the QTFA, and uh, we are developing a, um, a similar Q, uh, um, Quality, qualitative measures for um, the, the other parts of the body, um, uh, such as the tibia and the humerus. We do get analysis and um, we do get do uh, mobility predictors. We, we also take um, radiographs such as simple x-rays, long leg standing x-ray to check the uh, mechanical element of the body. Um, and we um, have um, uh, specialized CT scans um, um, that um, uh, measure the exact measurement of um, uh, of the internal diameter of the of the bone to um, assess what we're gonna do with uh, with the bone. We also measure preoperatively the bone quality of the patient uh, through DEXA scans, and we monitor them uh, after. We have few papers now showing that this technology improved the um, uh, bone mineral density for the patients. Um, before the surgery, patients uh, are encouraged to do um, uh, pre-operative um, uh, or pre-habilitation uh, training, and that involves core strength exercises, muscle strengthening, and um, um, uh, visualization, upper body strength, and assist in control of the prosthetic knee joint uh, for above knee amputees. Um, basically, this is what it is. This is what it looks like. Um, the surgery is um, is the simplest part of the of the whole process, um, uh, and basically we just um, open the leg, chop it off, shove a piece of metal inside, and connect it to the skin. Um, um, uh, connect it through through the skin through a small opening. Um, however. Uh, the hard work is uh, what comes before and what comes after and the selection criteria. Um, basically the patients after the surgery, um, they um, are allowed to have lymph drainage and, um, and uh, you know, wound care is very simple. Uh, we um, uh, start loading them um, uh, through a stump loader um, day one after the surgery and we discharge the patient after um, around a week or so. Um, the patient can shower after seven days and um, uh, can wet the leg and they can clean any debris with um, uh, with a toothbrush, um, um, not the same toothbrush that they use for their mouth, but um, a separate toothbrush, and uh, they can uh, shower regularly with their water and soap. Um, certain uh, red flags that um, uh, we need to uh, look um, uh, for, such as if the patient have pain, that means there is something wrong. Um, and um, I do dare to say that Patients should not have pain after the surgery because we have an excellent pain team management and, um, and with loading, they shouldn't get any pain. However, if there is loading pain, that indicate that there is loosening or uh, failure of integration. Um, if they have uh, foul discharge that is red um, and uh, or pussy, uh, then um, that indicate that there is something wrong. Um, any heat or redness is, is a problem and um, obviously bad odor. Um, this is how um, the skin implant interface looks and um, basically it's kind of weird concept. And um, ironically, I had only one patient that couldn't accept um, uh, the way it looked and it was a male patient who's a Paralympic athlete, which um, it was um, completely not expected. Um, it, we we thought that mainly ladies would uh, would not accept the way it looks, but um, people uh, do um, uh, accept it. Um, it's very simple to don and doff, and basically you can hook it up to uh, the uh, robotic leg or um, or the um, uh, prosthetic limb uh, with an Allen key. But we have different 
um, uh, kind of um, connectors now that are quick release. Um, what's very important is this picture. You can see that um, uh, in a socket, the femur, which is the um, thigh bone that is amputated, um, when it sits in a socket, it sits in an abduction uh, position like um, out, outside and flexed. Uh, while with an osseous integration uh, implant, it's mechanically aligned with the limb. And you can see with the, uh, the lady that's demonstrating her leg, uh, she has full control on the leg and she can um, and she can rotate it while in the socket, this is impossible. Um, Post-operative rehabilitation includes um, uh, basically three phases of rehabilitation. Uh, the first phase is the axial loading, um, and, um, and the second phase is uh, when we use a training prosthesis, and third phase when they go with their permanent prosthesis. Um, we have two different kind of speed of rehabilitation, depends on the patient and depends on the level of the amputation and the duration from uh, the amputation. Uh, the standard is uh, five kilograms day one post op, and increment by five kilograms uh, until they get to 50 or half of their body weight, and, and then they get fitted um, around week two. Um, well, the slow uh, protocol is five kilograms day one post op, and you increase the uh, the loading over a period of six weeks, and they get fitted at the six weeks mark um, with um, similar uh, loading. Um, Patient usually uh, uh, move to the uh, phase two, either at two weeks or at six weeks. And you can see this is one of my British patients, basically, um, who um, uh, has lost um, uh, three limbs. And um, he is um, uh, basically get using the uh, studies, uh, short leg prosthesis um, uh, in the training. And, um, and then, they walk with this training or, uh, prosthesis or light leg for um, uh, a period of time until they get um, comfortable with um, balance. Uh, we teach them how to fall. We teach them how to prevent fall. And um, once they are comfortable with, uh, with crutches, we move to phase three. With phase three, basically, if they have robotic legs, uh, then we can do um, uh, proper alignment measures with uh, with the laser, and um, and then we um, electronically uh, hook them up to the uh, to the uh, permanent prosthesis, uh, and um, and they learn how to walk with two crutches for the first uh, period. And you can see um, my prosthetist is holding the um, uh, his laptop and he's programming the prosthesis as you go. And I don't know if you can see the the blue lights in the in the limb uh, that it's buzzing um, uh, indicate that it's responsive to the patient gait. Um, the whole idea is uh, I do apologize for um, uh, this guy's shoes. He's, he's again he's a, one of the one of my British patients, um, and um, he uh, the whole idea is to teach them how to uh, get rid of the bad habits that they learned with the socket prosthesis and learn how to walk again um, naturally the way they were before the amputation because the way the system work it does allow proper gait cycle uh, as opposed to the socket prosthesis where you have to walk with circumduction um, they walk with two um, crutches for the first six weeks and uh, one crutch for another six weeks and then uh, they um, get rid of the crutch completely. I repeated this um, uh, image because this is the most important image that I can show you if I can uh, if you want to leave anything within your mind, uh, that's how it looks with uh, with the uh, with the technology that we provide, as compared to uh, uh, basically a socket or a traditional uh, socket mounted prosthesis. Um, one th one of the things that we discovered with this uh, by accident um, is that people regain their ability to feel the ground, and they they get what's called osseous perception. And it's amazing how people um, uh, react because if they close their eye and you tap on a uh, little tap on their big toe, they tell you it's a big toe. Um, um, and uh, it, it, remarkably the nerves um, uh, heal around the, um, uh, the, uh, the bone and the, and the implant and uh, start sensitizing uh, the, the position of the body uh, in space. Um, and you can see basically whether they are below knee amputee or an above knee amputee. Um, this patient on the right hand side, for example, he's a young man who returned back um, to manual labor and truck driving, and um, and he basically uh, destroy uh, prosthesis constantly because he's so active. And um, no matter what you do, uh, you can't um, get this mobility with a socket 
uh, prosthesis. Um, the whole idea is to return uh, back to um, uh, to your life and enjoy uh, living uh, with your family and uh, and enjoy sport and outdoors. Uh, it's very important with these kind of cases where uh, people uh, with a socket prosthesis they can't um, um, basically uh, perform any kind of sport activity. Um, patients have. Um, patient have uh, the ability to run again uh, with this prosthesis and um, uh, they can train. Um, um, people ask about uh, whether uh, people can dive or swim. Um, pretty much we don't stop anyone. And um, you have to believe me when I say that this, this patient is an amputee. I don't know which leg was it, but he managed to get his car out of the um, um, month basically. Um, walking to the beach, um, it's something that uh, people lose the ability to do with, with the socket because um, they have to take it off and then hobble around um, and so on. I can keep going with that. Now, talking about um, our statistics, um, um, the surgery is usually, um, uh, we have done around 737 implants in Australia, you can stop me if, uh, if you want me to, uh, to stop or I can uh, talk about um, the, uh, the statistics if everybody's happy. Um, we performed around 91 cases that are uh, two-stage prosthesis uh, a procedure, but uh, the majority of our cases were single-stage uh, procedure. Uh, majority of our patients are males and basically because a lot of the patients that are treated are soldiers and um, we have patients from all around the world. Uh, basically, the United Kingdom is the, the fourth largest number of patients that we uh, treated. Majority of our patients are um, uh, due to um, uh, trauma and um, having said that, we have treated um, uh, 34 vascular patients and that is the largest number of uh, growth that will happen. Um, our patients uh, are mainly uh, trans uh, femoral amputees, and um, um, basically there are um, um, patients that uh, are mixed with uh, transtibial, transfemoral, or transhumeral. Uh, we have treated a lot of bilateral amputees, and uh, you can see the growth of the number of patients um, um, basically over uh, the years when we started with a single case in 2010, and then we increased um, uh, gradually and slowly um, uh, throughout the years. Now, one thing we, we have noticed is that people, when they start with their K-levels, which is the ability of um, uh, forking, the majority of them, you can see, we did this uh, simple study on, um, on, on some soldiers uh, where the vast majority of them were uh, K-0, as, and that means wheelchair bound. And then after the surgery, the vast majority of them ended up with K3, that mean uh, community ambulator. And this is the biggest damning um, evidence of um, how important uh, this technology and how it can uh, change uh, people's lives. Obviously, uh, we do have complications, we do have problems, uh, but um, infection is still regarded as within acceptable limits. And, um, and we are lowering down the infection uh, uh, rapidly, basically, with um, uh, the more we know about um, how to treat uh, these uh, patients and how to refine our technique, uh, things are getting better and better. Um, basically, uh, the, the, the systems that are available around the world, majority of the knowledge is about transfemoral amputees. So we kind of embarked on a new territory with transtibial amputees as in below knee amputees. And um, um, that's why we're having higher complications there because nobody has done it before us. Uh, but um, overall, uh, the complication rate is reducing. Uh, you can see that um, people do uh, need refashioning, do need debridement, and they do break uh, uh, around the, the implant, but um, uh, we have managed to fix uh, pretty much every fractures that we had. Um, when we compare two-stage surgery versus one-stage uh, surgery, uh, the complication rate is much higher. That's why we advocate single-stage surgery. It's one operation, um, much easier for the patient, and it has lower complication rate. And when you look at the protocols with revisions in femur only, the complication rate is equivalent to a hip replacement complication rate. Um, I better stop here. This is my, one of my favorite patients. I get bored very uh, quickly. So I don't know if you know Noel Fitzpatrick. Um, he, um, 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 I, I had the pleasure of meeting him a few times. So I decided to do uh, a dog basically. 
So I think I um, um, exceeded my time. Um, I don't want to go for complex cases, but um, I'm more than happy to answer questions. My wife is telling me to stop. <laughs> uh, we've all had that experience, Professor Muderis. Um, yeah. But <laughs> thank you very much indeed. That was fascinating, uh, inspiring, and so patently worthwhile. Um, well, uh, let me start with questions, if I may. Uh, I've got a written question from uh, John Corey, who says, uh, obviously, this is quite new technology. Do you have any expectations of long term performance, which could be 50 years or more? Um, well, the, sorry, uh, you're saying the, the long term? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the longest um, uh, patient that I've done it was 11 years ago and he's still going. Uh, so, um, uh, so basically, um, uh, actually my patient number one, um, um, just recently fractured his implant and, uh, due to fatigue. So we had to uh, take the implant, out, the broken implant out and replace it with a new one and he's going, uh, so, um, um, we have, um, patients that have been going for 10 years, uh, and more and, um, the, the, and none of the patients in the early stage have, well, basically out of the almost 1000 cases that we have done, um, I know two only that went back to a socket prosthesis. And that's a pretty good record, isn't it? Um, can I just remind people that they can use the hat, put your hand up function. And uh, we, uh, unless you're very, very shy, we can then see your picture, but please feel free to use that. Um, uh, facility as well. Um, I've got one more written question and then I think a, a video question from Andrew Bell. I have a written question. Is there anything you can do to spot fatigue failures before they occur? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. And I just uh, mentioned that uh, my first patient had um, uh, fatigue. Basically, it's uh, uh, you can't because, uh, uh, well, we are trying to um, uh, develop um, a sensor inside the implant uh, that can uh, sense the um, uh, uh, crack propagation uh, or the fatigue uh, of the implant beforehand. And um, um, we're working with a couple of universities to develop this sensor for us. Um, uh, also, um, in this sensor, we're trying to implement as well uh, um, uh, sensitivity to uh, microbial organisms. Uh, so it can, it can give us an indication if there is an infection as well. Uh, so, um, but, um, but unfortunately, all metal fatigues. Uh, and, uh, but the way we designed the implant, uh, so the, the fractures that we had are... Um, uh, all in the older design where it was chrome, chrome cobalt, which is much more uh, stiff and um, has a higher modulus of elasticity uh, than titanium. I haven't had any fractures in the titanium implant so far, touch wood. Great, thank you. Uh, Fred McKeating asks, well, he, he says pound questions, but I think he means, what does it cost? <laughs> Just pretty clear. Yes. Um, so the pound question, um, well, obviously, like any technology, when it starts, it's very expensive. Um, in the UK now, it is available and um, uh, through um, certain insurance. And uh, the pound question is, I think it's um, it's around thirty thousand um, pounds. But it's it's um, cheaper than the equivalent, the Swedish system and 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 few other systems. Um, Obviously, the more it's done, the more readily available, the, the price will go down dramatically. My hope uh, is that in the coming 10 years, this, this technology will be readily available to people who need it most, people who cannot afford it in developing countries um, uh, such as Southeast Asia, war zones. And I hope that um, I can drop the price of the implant to around the 2,000 pounds, which is equivalent to a hip replacement. Fantastic. Um, I've got a video question now from John Cook, please. Uh, thank you for a, an amazing talk. I was particularly inspired by the photos of people walking in the mountains and, uh, and cycling afterwards. It's something I like to do. Um, you, our, our last uh, our talk was about interfacing electronics with the brain. Um, yep. And you early on in your talk mentioned the um, 
uh, progress being made in, in connecting to, to nerves. Is there any um, aim to integrate all these, these processes with the robotic limb? Because you, uh, with a, a robotic limb, because also integration gives you a much cleaner connection yep. ability. So, so it's, uh, I need another half an hour to, uh, to, to talk about the in upper limb. That's what we do. Um, so, um, so, um, um, I don't know if um, any of you heard about uh, uh, of Norbert Kang. He's one of the uh, British uh, surgeons that uh, work in uh, uh, the Royal Free, and um, he's a good mate of mine now. And um, uh, we um, work together a lot on uh, um, uh, something called targeted muscle reinnovation. Basically, what we get, we get the the, the nerves of the brachial plexus of the arm that um, from the amputated limb, and we pull them apart and then um, uh, like cables and then we rewire them and reroute them to muscles that are not used anymore and then connect these um, uh, these muscles become an amplifiers for uh, the electronic signals and then connect these muscles to the robotic arm uh, basically uh, so it is happening we've been doing that and we've done uh, around 25 cases so far in in, in australia and um, uh, similar numbers in the united kingdom um, uh, with very, very um, impressive results. Uh, in the lower limb, uh, the um, uh, technology uh, is not uh, that necessary because um, basically you don't need to um, give orders to, to the leg to walk. Um, um, it's more, it's different, it's more gyroscopes um, um, where the sense of position is more important and uh, um, during the gait cycle, the uh, the robotic leg can read uh, what's happening with the body posture as well as read what's happening with the opposite leg, and as a result of that, it will react. Um, so it's much more responsive. Uh, while with upper limb, you need to tell the arm to go and grab the cup of coffee and uh, and pull it to your, um, uh, close to your mouth. So um, it's more brain kind of uh, ordering the, uh, the arm. So, um, so that's why it's more important in the upper limb. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, having, sorry, having, having said that, uh, there is a, a technique called Ewing amputation, which um, I haven't done one. I'm, I booked my first patient for next month. And that's basically for patients who want to sit and cross their legs and wiggle their toes. They can do that. Sorry. Fantastic. Yep. Uh, Sean Blake asks, uh, it says, thank you for a very interesting talk. What feature of the technology controls the risk of ascending infection? Um, well, the, 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 uh, as in the, the technology that to prevent Ascending infection, is that right? Is that the question? Um, I think the question is what what makes it more or less likely or what feature of the technology oh, yeah. controls that rate of... Uh, uh, yeah, so, so basically what we found out uh, from uh, the old technologies of putting external fixatives on people is that um, the less soft tissue uh, you have, uh, the less movement you have, the more stability with the bone, the less chance you get infection, okay? Movement creates um, um, uh, inflammation and that inflammation creates uh, over-colonization of bacteria. And as a result of that, uh, bacteria will migrate into the, uh, the tissue. However, um, the implant itself has certain kind of um, uh, um, features that um, such as the coating, the, it's nanoparticle coated with titanium niobium oxide, um, and which is bacteria repellent. Um, the surface structure uh, with the plasma coating cause proper uh, integration of the bone uh, on it. So it doesn't leave any pores uh, for the bacteria to grow through. And, um, uh, and the, the, the high level of polishing um, of the implants uh, basically reduce the friction with the, with the soft tissue. Uh, and that itself uh, reduce the chance of infection. Great. Um, Fred McKeating is, is back. Um, his first question was about uh, infection, so I won't do that again, but he then has two more questions. Um, how do you encourage the 
ostracites to colonize the titanium core and how difficult is it to remove a fractured implant? Um, well, <laughs> basically, uh, the ostracites are not that smart and uh, the titanium is extremely inert and um, um, basically the osteocytes does not, uh, do not recognize it um, any different to the bone. So basically when it moves, become an osteoblast, they just grow in it and throw um, collagen over it and becomes bone as well. So it, it treats it like part of the bone. So this is um, uh, why it is hell of a difficult job to remove a fractured implant because uh, when it's integrated, it is very difficult. You have to basically chisel the bone off it. And uh, a lot of the time um, uh, you, we have uh, developed um, a special side, uh, type of cora where it cores the, uh, the bone around the implant um, uh, to, in order to remove it. Funny enough, um, the good thing about it, when you load the bone, the bone grows in diameter, um, uh, basically, and strengthens. So, um, uh, so um, to remove the implant, you 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 kind of, um, uh, if it's well integrated, you would have more uh, result, uh, reservoir uh, of bone that has grown around the implant uh, and strengthen itself. So it's kind of um, a balance. I must say the idea of it being chiseled out makes one shudder somewhat, but I presume your <laughs> patients are anaesthetized. <laughs> they, they won't feel it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, somebody who wishes to remain nameless, but they uh, has sent in a question, but it's a very sensible question. If you're using cobalt, are there any risks of cobalt poisoning such as occurred with the cobalt based hip replacements? Uh, yes, that is a very good question. Um, uh, the answer is no, uh, unless you have fritting. Um, there are no mobile parts in the um, uh, in the implant, so there is no friction and there is no um, uh, basically uh, particles that are released into the body. Uh, the implant is, the, though the cobalt implant, I don't use the cobalt implant anymore. That was when we first uh, started because that was the implant that was available to me at the time. And, um, and we designed our implant, which is based on titanium. And, um, uh, but the, in, in defense of that particular implant, it is coated with titanium anyway. So the core is cobalt, but the surface is titanium and there is no movement in it. Well, President Medeiros, uh, I, I think uh, you've exhausted people, or not in the nicest possible way, by answering the questions uh, so comprehensively. Thank you so much uh, at so many levels. An absolutely inspiring uh, talk. Uh, we love the idea of uh, medicine and engineering being integrated in such a, a practical and symbiotic way, if that's the right word. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll watch uh, with interest and joy, the fact that you can get the price of this thing down. So uh, it will make life better for thousands and thousands of people. Thank you for taking time. Um, not only have you been at work all day, but I understand you had a baby 10 years ago, so you're probably not getting much sleep either. Uh, so we're, uh, we're particularly, ten, 10 days ago, um, particularly grateful for you taking uh, time out. And I hope now um, you can go and get a drink. We're accustomed at the end of CSR lectures well, some people leave their screen off and have a drink during the lecture, but afterwards, I suspect many people do, but it's only breakfast time here, so it would be rather improper, but that's no reason why you shouldn't have a glass of something. Uh, richly yeah, I'll, and we thank you I'll most. definitely go and get, get a glass of wine. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for having much. me. All the best. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah.